Hello everyone. In the previous part, I discussed the fundamentals of neutral diffusion analysis technique, very powerful technique for determination of concentration of elements. And nearly 70% of the elements in the periodic table are amenable to neutral diffusion analysis. Different elements have different sensitivity, different detection limits because of their nuclear data. In this part, I will discuss some of the applications of neutron activation analysis. So, neutron activation analysis has found applications in large variety of fields, starting from geology to biology, food and nutrition, environmental sciences, nuclear technology, in chemical sciences, even in healthcare, archaeology forensic sciences and material sciences. So you can see in, in, whenever, wherever, in any area where it is required to find out the concentration of elements, you will find neutron activation analysis is one of the important techniques worth considering. And particularly in those areas like nuclear forensic, forensic science, archaeology or even the geology, you know, where you may like to retain the samples for any future investigation, then this, this technique scores over other techniques. If the idea is only to determine concentration, there may be techniques, other techniques like chemical science, material science, you may have other techniques like spectroscopic based techniques. But those samples, which are mixed samples, and you may have, you know, you want to preserve the sample, and but you are looking for a particular element then you will find and they, if that element happens to be sensitive to connection analysis. And so people working in different fields have taken NAA for their studies in R&D area. So I will not be able to cover all of them. I will cover some of them like archaeology, forensic science, geology, food and nutrition and healthcare. So let me see how much justice I can do. Okay. So, archaeology. Archaeology, you know, there are excavations to know the past civilization. But there are many, you know, many areas where the archaeologists want to find out what is the, you know, the composition of a particular artifact, which is found out in some excavations. So, or for example, like you know, I was telling you that you can do dating of the fossils. So, archaeologists would like to know how old the particular place is. For example, there is a temple and you want to find out when this temple was built. You just take a fossil uh, sample, the wood sample from that and you can find out the age of that temple. Similarly, you have then the ancient pottery samples. So from like, for example, Mohan Jodaro and Harappa, if you get some pottery and you want to know the concentration, you want to understand the kind of technology people had at that time. Uh, and nowadays, you know, somebody may claim that this is of that origin. So it is Harappan time. How do you make sure this is of Harappan time? It is not a fake. These days, there is a lot of adulteration in many things. So even suppose somebody is selling a archaeological artifact and earning money, one would like to know scientifically whether it is of that time. So you need to characterize that artifact. You need to find out what is the origin of this. So the ancient pottery, they had well characterized concentration of different elements. There is a signature concentration of elements. So you can do analysis of this pottery and find out that this is genuine or not. Obsidian a type of igneous rocks. So you can try to understand the volcanic eruptions that happened, what kind of rocks were generated in the volcanic eruption. The shards, this is the sedimentary rocks, how the sedimentation process took place you know, over a period of time, the basalt, and the limestone type of uh, the clays, you know, different geological and archaeological samples so you can analyze and as a you know, data of research and development or to characterize and do some versions of this artifacts. So this is a, a particular gamma spectrum of an ancient pottery sample. A sample was irritated for let us say five seconds 
the T I E radiation five seconds. After the irradiation, they waited for twenty five minutes to cool the sample. Cooling means E H two minus T lambda T C. So cooling may be required because it makes some time to take the time to take the sample out of the reactor to your laboratory. That may take some time. And sometimes the you may produce some shorter lived activity which you are not of your interest. And then you it was counted for twelve minutes. So I have taken this from the reference of Michael Glasshock. Glasshock. And you can see here the interesting aspect of this is the typical gamma spectrum of a HPG detector. You have up to right up to three MeV, three thousand keV. So you can see a large number of elements the isotope have amenable to gamma ray. Dysprosium, barium, titanium, manganese, magnesium, sodium, aluminium, vanadium, potassium, and all elements. So sodium and calcium. Some sometimes, you no know, one isotope may have several gamma rays like sodium. So like that, in one shot, one spectrum, you can analyze. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, about eight, eight to ten. Sometimes even it can be more. So a single gamma spectrum. One count of a one counting of the sample, you can analyze multiple elements in the sample. So that is the beauty of this, and the archaeological samples of very type, varied sources can be analyzed to find out the source of that part, the particular artifact, or you can even do research. You know how the evolution took place. You can understand by photon activation analysis. Another classes of this, like sometimes you can do the. Provenance is study of archaeological samples. Again, this is the kind of pottery, you know, large size potteries. Some there, there was there was some, you know, sometimes when you are doing research, archaeologists may like to do some investigation of ancient potteries and to establish their source, what where from they came, and so for such samples. In fact, my in my department, one of our colleagues, you know, is an expert in the neutron activation analysis. So he has supplied me this data, Dr. Acharya. So he has uh, used these samples, and these samples now you can take a small sample of this artifact and uh, do the neutron detection analysis. And as I mentioned, that in these samples it is not known what are the elements. We cannot have the standards for these reference materials are not available. So it is at that time the internal mono standard. That means uh, this sample make one of the Uh, elements in the sample may may be used as a reference material isotope like scandium. So scandium has got decay characteristics. We can use them. So all elements with respect to scandium, we can determine their concentration. So scandium has good geochemical properties and nuclear properties, the decay characteristics, and it, it is scandium is in the family of rare earths. So scandium, yttrium, and then the below is that the lanthanides coming. So the chemically, you know, they are similar to lanthanides. So this this is a typical efficiency graph because what you require is a good efficiency data. Relative efficiency so efficiency of detection depends upon the gamma ray energy, and so the uncertainties are introduced because suppose you have this scandium gamma one here. You are using the other gamma here, so ratio of efficiencies becomes important. If you do not have a good efficiency data, then your your analysis may be wrong. So, in situ relative efficiency of the pottery sample from the same sample, we generate the efficiency data because the standard is also in the same sample, like scandium. And so, you require to have the gamma rays, multiple gamma rays in the same sample, and internally you can generate the efficiency data. With respect to that standard like uh, scandium, you can determine the concentration of all of the elements, and so you can now do the provenance study. You can generate the data of the concentration of certain group of elements which will characterize the particular pottery, and then this is the kind of study you can do. You do not need any external standards because initially you don't know what are the elements present in that. This is the kind of research one can do to characterize the samples of ancient origin in archaeology. Another is the geology, earth, and apart from earth, earthly objects, you can do the meteorites that are coming from the planets. So the meteorites, these meteors that are coming to earth, and you would like to know 
from which planet or from there it is come from some other place what is the source of this meteorite so our the geology people they are they are trying to characterize the different meteorites present and uh, you can even compare with other meteorites so one of the studies was analysis of meteorites by internal mono standards from the gamma neutron active analysis suppose you have a big chunk of meteorite so in prompt gamma as i mentioned the neutron beam is out of the reactor building reactor hall and then you can expose the entire sample to the neutrons and then the gamma rays are detected by the so in odisha in september 27 2003 a meteorite was fell on the earth and that is named as jagannath meteorite so this jagannath meteorite was characterized by by colleagues at arc and it is published in journal so i have taken the data from dr acharya and you can see here the elements that are present iron silicon chromium potassium magnesium calcium nickel jagannath meteorite concentrations you can see in terms of the percentage all of them are in percentage 27% 15.1 0.39 0.18 11.6 and so on and uh, you can also compare them with other meteorites elsewhere published by other colleagues other researchers obe meteorites check meteorites and then you can do whether it is the you know whether it is the authentic meteorite or what is the origin of this what way it is different from this meteorite so what was found that the the elemental concentration of this meteorite was found to be different from that of the earth crust and it was found to be close to these other meteorites so essentially this they wanted to confirm first of all that it is an authentic meteorite it is not no somebody may say it takes a rock and say this is the meteorite so sometimes people may do business also they just sell this meteorite it is from other planet so to make sure that it is an authentic meteorite and also to compare it with other meteorites and you can do r and d so what are the source of this meteorite so this kind of study Uh, what can do in the field of earth and planetary science then one of the most important area wherein the neutron activation finds lot of applications so i will just do one of the a story from not a story the actual research that happened in the case of investigating the death of napoleon bonaparte napoleon bonaparte was the french dictator in the 19th century and he he was actually defeated in the war of waterloo by the british army in 1815 and then he was exiled to a place called saint helena and there in exile napoleon died so there were a lot of speculations about you no know, how napoleon died whether he was that he was poisoned or not and so you see 1850 21 is a long time past but still you know when he was a emperor and so some scientists wanted to investigate that he died of poisoning or he died on a natural death because he was not very old at that time so then in 1952 the hair sample of napoleon were collected from that place saint elena and this hair sample was subjected to neutron activation analysis by neutron capture reaction on arsenic 75 arsenic is monoisotopic so you get arsenic 76 by n gamma reaction and what was found that the activity of arsenic 76 in this napoleon's hair sample was found to be 7 to 38 times higher than what you get in the normal hair so it was no doubt that Ars napoleon's hair had very high concentration of arsenic than in the normal okay the question was whether napoleon was poisoned with arsenic or not in 1987 this investigation was going on they wanted to investigate where from the arsenic came into the hair and so there was they found that there was a wallpaper in napoleon's house in saint helena and that the pigment in that wallpaper was a, some the pigment it contained arsenic 
and arsenic is known to form volatile compounds. So, the green pigment contains arsenic and it is possible that under the conditions, atmospheric environmental conditions, arsenic might get airborne and the arsenic is known to form complex with organic molecules and then it could be inhaled by Elena as this Napoleon and uh, might have killed. So, there was a theory going on in that time that arsenic, Napoleon was poisoned slowly by giving him arsenic land and food, but it was not known who killed Napoleon. And of course, what was the motivation for killing Napoleon because he was already in exile, but it generated a lot of interest among the community uh, historians. They wanted to know what is the why, why Napoleon won, whether it was, it was really poisoned by arsenic, you know, we don't know, but a lot of research went and the neutron activation played an important role in coming to this conclusion that Ars Napoleon's hair contained large concentration of arsenic than what is present in normal people. You can see here, this is the gamma spectrum of arsenic 76, 559 and 67 kV gamma ray. So, you can really know, selectively you can find out peak area of these peaks and find out the concentration of the arsenic in the sun. Another area in the forensic science where neutron activation analysis is used in the gunshot residue analysis, in the crime investigation, you know, somebody fires a bullet and the, the gun is recovered from the site, but then you want to know who fired that bullet. So the, the culprit, you know, you have to unambiguously prove. So see, in uh, many places, no, you go by the witness. The witness says, I have seen this person firing but the witness may turn hostile after some time. So, the statement of a witness, it can vary and you cannot rely on the witnesses for the final judgment. So, always, you know, forensic science relies on the scientific evidence of the culprit. So, you have to correlate with the weapon and the culprit. So, how do you do that? What was found that this gunshot residue, you know, if somebody fires a gun, then that person's hand contains the residue of the powder, gunpowder. So, you can analyze the gunpowder from the hands of the culprit. Of course, by the time if the culprit has washed the hands, then you cannot do anything. But if the, you, can, you can catch the culprit and you can get some sample from that hand of the culprit, so the alleged culprit, analyze that samples for the particular component. So, in this case, Barium and antimony are the two elements which are not very common in the soil samples or dust samples at our, you know, suppose you get some dust, so it may also contain. So, these are not very commonly available, like commonly you get iron, scandium, aluminum and so on, magnes, magnesium and so on. So, what was found that this gunshot, you know, gunpowder and gunshot residue contained barium and antimony and they were actually taken as signatures of the bullets the, 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 that are the gunpowder that's used and so if, if a person's hand was found to be contaminated with these elements, he is a prospective So, gunshot residues, GSR to be abbreviated, left with the hand of the individual after firing can be used as a scientific evidence for correlating with the person who did the crime. The barium and antimony are present in this residues. And so, what essentially do the different types of the guns, you know, you can collect the data, the kind of con con concentration ratios of barium and strontium from in the gun guns of different types of firing guns and the different individuals, and you can generate a database and then you can pinpoint that suppose you recover the, the gun that was from the crime scene and you have 10 people who are suspects. So, you can, you can analyze the sample from the, the persons and correlate. This is the person whose sample is matching with the gun recovered from the site. So, that is the kind of scientific evidence generated. Maybe scientifically, you can you know, nail, nail the culprit, you want, then one cannot escape. They have to accept. So this is the kind of analysis people do in the forensic investigations. 
Then in food and nutrition, there are lot of applications. And you know, people who are doing research in this area, you will find NA is very, very popular. So there are many elements which at trace level play vital role in our biochemical system or in enzymatic processes. In this, there are, actually like there are micronutrients in the, there are many elements which are beneficial to our health. And those elements, you know, see they are, there is a deficiency of these elements, we get sick. If there is excess of this element, then they become toxic. And there is an optimum level of concentration of these elements they are required for a good health. So the deficiency or excess of certain elements in our body leads to disorders and diseases. And therefore, you know, we need to have a balanced diet, a really controlled diet containing those elements. Certain elements are toxic, they are not needed by our body like you know arsenic, mercury, chromium, lead and, the, and above, up, out of them certain elements like selenium, in fact arsenic has got medicinal value, some of the you know some people used to recommend this mercury, lead and asthma as you know also contains they have some medicinal value. So but in, in terms of the nutritional elements selenium and iodine are nutritional elements they are required for the body. For example, selenium, actually I will discuss more on the selenium NAA. Selenium this is present in organo, uh, organo selenium is useful for the body and uh, the selenium can also lead to normalities in the humans and animals. So it is essential for the body at low concentration but at high concentration it becomes toxic. So we will discuss the NAA of arsenic, selenium and iodine. In arsenic and selenium, there are you no know, limits prescribed by the WHO World Health Organization that uh, any drinking water should not contain arsenic or selenium less more than this concentration like 10 ppb. So and then this, since these elements are useful for our body, they we require them. There are daily recommended daily intake values. For example, for iodine, we have 50 to 150 microgram per day. For selenium, people have been taking this kind of concentrations. And so these are the elements, you know, either if they are in deficiency in our body, they can lead to problem. If there is an excess, they become toxic. They can lead to even like thyroid disorders are due to iodine. So this, all the three elements are amenable to neutral nitrogen analysis, arsenic 75 and gamma, iodine 157 and gamma, selenium 76 and gamma. So they are, I will give you some examples of activation analysis using for these elements. So arsenic in environment, there are safe limits for drinking water, less than 10 nanogram, microgram per liter, PPB. So it has the good and the bad part of it. Arsenic, ars, ars, in trivalent state, has shown remarkable arsenic oxide, not trivalent, ars, not arsenious acid, but arsenic oxide, arsenious oxide has found to be therapeutic efficacy. Patients which are suffering from acute bromelectic leukemia and methylated arsenic, organic arsenic has been known to have anti cancer activity. The bad part of it is that. Arsenic can induce carcinogenicity in the human beings. And there are many areas in the world, including some, some part in the, our country, they have about more than 40 countries in the world have drinking water concentrations more than 10 microgram per liter. And that leads to arsenic toxicity. Excess of high concentration of ar uh, arsenic affects organs causing to dysfunction of so many organs, damaging the organs and so on. So ar arsenic you know, can become airborne because it has a tendency to bind with the organic molecules in present in drinking water and food. So many you know, people are sus susceptible to arsenic poisoning. As a species arsenic present, if it is arsenic acid, arsenic in pentavalent state, it is less toxic than arsenious acid which is in the trivalent. So, trivalent arsenic is absorbed by the body and it can lead to hydrogen. Organic arsenides are, they are considered to be less toxic and so 
you know, some of them in fact have some medicine for therapeutic application they are being utilized. As I was telling that the oxygen state of arsenic is important. The trivalent arsenic, arsenious acid is more toxic than pentavalent acid. And so uh, people are doing the speciation. That means you separate the elements depending upon their oxidation state. And for inorganic arsenic, one can use a cation exchanger, an ion exchanger, Dovex 1 cross 8 in acetic form. So one of the columns will retain arsenic 5 and elute arsenic 3. And then the retained arsenic 5 can be eluted by some other. So, a lot of you know, people who do research in food and nutrition, they need to also separate arsenic in different of these states. So, this is one of the study of our colleagues at BARC. They found that you can separate more than 95% of arsenic with a good chemical yield using ion exchange and sound extraction. So, speciation in, in neuron and neutronics analysis. In combination with speciation, becomes a very important tool to study the toxicity associated with different oxygen states of energy. Iodine is another important element which is required for the body. Our body, like thyroid hormones, contain iodine. Like there are three thyroid hormones: T3, T4, and TSH. And what is the source of iodine that we have? The, it is important to know the content of iodine in different food samples. So you have milk powders. So this group did actually the, the, the nutrition analysis of different milk powders, baby food, different baby foods, low fat, milk powder and so on and found out the concentration of iodine in milligram per kg and the gamma ray spectrum of iodine 127 iodine and gamma 128 iodine you can see the 443 KeV gamma ray, highly selective. So you do not have any doubt. There is no interference in that peak area. So this is the kind of study people do to find out iodine in different. So you can just irradiate the powder without doing any chemistry. Irradiate, you seal it in a in a container, aluminum foil. Irradiate and count for gamma activity. You can find out the iodine content. Selenium is another important element. It has got both the aspect good and the bad. Low selenium content, there can be selenium deficiency. Selenium is required for our body. Selenium deficiency can lead to diseases. For example, there is a skin disease called keratosis pilaris. It, it, it leads to cracking of the skin. The skin becomes very rough because of the selenium deficiency. Excess of selenium in our body leads to allowing in animals cracking of their hooves and cracking of the nails. Can take place if we have excess of selenium. So normal range of selenium. So selenium can be picked up by different plants and when we consume those plants our body will accumulate selenium. So in soil selenium content is an important parameter. If there is a selenium rich soil then the people living in that area, people eating the vegetation in that area are prone to getting selenium problems. So normal concentration is 0.03 to 0.08 microgram per gram ppb. And selenium concentration can go to very high, in fact very very high concentrations are also seen in the world. So while selenium in excess concentration is toxic and low concentration is also not desirable, and in low concentration the deficiency of selenium can lead to diseases, there are the good part of selenium because it is essential to human health. Selenoproteins are required for generating thyroid hormone T3 from T4, so to convert T4 to T3 requires selenoproteins and selenium is believed to play important role in the brain development. So you will find that it is, it is again the story where an element is good for health at the same time at when there is a deficiency or an excess then it can lead to disease. So these are the results of a selenium determination by reproduction analysis and you can see mustard, a particular mustard or no, from that particular area was found to contain very high concentration of selenium. So people who are consuming that mustard might be getting excess of, and this also shows that selenium can be localized. Particularly, you know, the mustard contains some sulfur compound. And wherever there is sulfur, sulfur and selenium are homologues of each other. So sulfur, selenium will go along with sulfur. So 
any plant containing excess of sulfur will enrich the selenium. Therefore, it is important to study the concentration of selenium in different plants so that one can understand whether there is a selenium related diseases in the population in the area. So lastly, oh, these are the another area of study was this coal fly ash. No? This, there are thermal power stations emitting lot of uh, flue gases and this uh, flue gases laws cause pollution in the area around the thermal power plant you will find lot of dust settled everywhere and there are the people who are exposed to this uh, you know the dust you no know, they get the diseases so it is important to convince ourselves that people living in that area are safe so that dust the coal fly ash was analyzed in our, in our laboratory for the concentration of this metal metals you can see sodium magnesium aluminum potassium scandium so whatever is percentage is percentage rest are in ppm values and you can see here different samples the concentrations of the different say, hundreds of ppm strontium cerium nidrinium thorium and uranium so this coal fly ash can have a, can be used as a rich source of certain elements whereas at the same time high concentration of certain elements can lead to diseases in the area and so in the environmental clearances of certain plants you know these are the data utilized for seeing that the plant is working in the proper way so that's all i had to convey there are many many more applications of naa but in the short time span of time when you can always go and look at literature and see what are the kind of different applications in different area so i'll stop here and the next lecture i will take the ion beam analysis under under a nuclear analytical technique thank you very much